everybody. It is good to see you. So glad y'all are here this Wednesday night afternoon. I'm going to teach you a new song. I know that's your favorite statement from me, but I'm going to teach you a new song, all right? Would you stand up with us? This song is very, uh, it may be a little different than what you've heard before, but it's still the same message. It's basically the, uh, the Apostles' Creed put to song. And so it's something that, uh, it should be something that you believe in. Hopefully it is. But it simply says, I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, for he is three in one. All right. And so uh, if you know it, sing along. If you don't, act like you do with a smile on your face. All right. Some of you get that later. Jesus, 
Father, we say that tonight with authority, that, God, we believe in you, and we thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives. God, we just thank you for how you move and how you speak. And that, God, one day you did lay your life down on the line for us to take our sin and take our shame away so that one day we could be with you in heaven. So, Father, we just thank you. And speak through Brother Dennis now as he speaks and brings your word. And just, God, speak through him. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Hold on to your seats and turn to Revelation, the 19th chapter. Revelation 19. Well, usually when I get to chapter 19, I always like to preface this by saying, if you have struggled at all through the first 18 chapters of Revelation, then I've got some good news for you tonight. Really got some good news tonight. Because when you come to the 19th chapter of Revelation, here's the good news. The struggles are now over. And now the shouting is about to begin. <laughs> when I get to the 19th chapter, for me, the confusion is over. All the confusion is now behind us. And now it's time for celebration to begin. This is the biggest event that I believe that we as saints are looking forward to and yet in the future. You ever, has there ever been a time in your life there's an event that, you know, it's a few weeks out or it's a few months away or, you know, there's been times when I've planned things and we still got a year. And boy, the closer we get to that day, the anticipation, it just begins to build. I was kind of that way a few weeks ago, anticipating our Liberty Celebration Sunday. Boy, and when I was about to explode before the day got here. I, I was just looking forward to it. You're not going to believe this, but I'm just about to pop now because football kicks off in about eight weeks. I'm just, <laughs> you know, just the anticipation and just the building and the possibilities of what LSU might or might not do. Well, for me, the anticipation of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Wow. And just all that will happen and the things that we'll see and the things that we will experience, I'm telling you, anticipation. I can't wait for that great and glorious day. Listen closely. The invitations to the marriage supper of the Lamb has already been sent out. Do you have yours tonight? Have you received your invitation? Are you anticipating that day, that moment? Let me tell you something. According to the Scripture, all the guests are being assembled even as I speak tonight. When we get to the 19th chapter tonight, the bride and the groom is now arriving for the great celebration. Wow, what a moment. Because now, finally, after all this time, the wedding is about to commence. Everybody loves weddings. Well, most folks enjoy weddings. Now, I haven't really met many men that enjoy weddings, but have you ever heard the, the expression, wedding of the century? Well, this is going to be the wedding 
of the ages. This great event is going to be a wedding like you have never, ever seen or ever even participated in. This wedding is going to be the wedding of the Lamb. Oh, the wedding of the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Say it out loud. Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And at this great wedding, the bride is going to be who? The body of Christ. So, I ask this question, how many brides do we have in the house tonight? Now, my friend, listen to me. That's not a female thing. If you've been born into the family of God, you're part of the bride. Amen. We are the bride. Now, before... Now, I know you've never seen this before, but you will tonight. Generally, you go to the wedding, and the celebration follows. But this great event, the celebration comes first, and then the wedding. <laughs> That's good for me. Because I love to eat. <laughs> huh? Oh, Lord. Let's don't talk about ice cream tonight. Let's read it for a few moments in the 19th chapter. And I want to begin in verse 1 and read through to verse 10. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again, they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen. Alleluia. And then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let's stop there. So everything thus far up through the 18th chapter is now been the preparation to get us ready for the 19th chapter. This is so fitting because we talked about it Sunday. Thus far, we've seen some, in the beginning parts of Revelation, we saw some good things, but then we've, boy, we've seen a lot of rough things. 
But isn't it amazing how all the good and all the bad, and God can put it all together, and now we're fixing to celebrate. It's going to be a glorious day, folks, when we arrive at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You say, what is the marriage supper of the Lamb? Well, it is the celebration that actually takes place in heaven where the bride and the groom will be united together forever and forever. Now, I've already said this, but the bride is the church. And the groom is King Jesus. Now, the Bible does not at all describe the marriage ceremony. That's one of those details that's been left out. I have no clue what the actual marriage ceremony is going to be like. What God does share with us is the celebration, or we call it, when we go to weddings, the reception. And the Bible describes it in almost incredible detail. So that celebration is referred to as the marriage supper of the Lamb. So are you ready? Let's let the celebration began now. Let's peek over, just have a little peek tonight of what you and I, every one of us, every man, every woman, every young person, regardless of how you were raised, regardless of what your ideas might be, I'm going to show you tonight in the scripture how we are going to celebrate in the very near future. And the celebration begins with the praise of or from the saints. It begins with praise from the saints. Now, let's consider this praise for just a moment. There are several things that I want you to see. Because let me, let me, let me begin this by saying this. <clears throat> there are a lot of people today... There are a lot of Christians today who find it difficult to express praise unto the Lord. But I'm going to show you something that all of us are going to do in the future. Verse 1, we see the period of praise, the period of praising. Verse 1 says, after these Things. After these things, there's going to be praising. After what things? Well, if you go back to Revelation chapter 1 and read through, he's talking about after the rapture of the church. After all of the bloodshed has concluded, after the mark of the beast has already been given out, after the persecution uh, of the church, after the collapse of the devil's monetary system, after the devil's collapse of the world government and and even the, the worldwide church. Watch this. John says, after all of those things, after all of that is over, then celebration will begin. Hallelujah. Now, who's going to be involved in all this praising? Who's going to be involved in it? Look again at verse 1. John says, he talks about the people of the praising. He says, I heard a loud voice. What does verse 1 call it? What does he say? Of a great what? Multitude. Now, who will this great multitude be? Who will be the actual ones that will be praising the Lord. Well, let me remind you, 
we had a hint early on in our study. It goes back to the seventh chapter of Revelation, chapter 7 and verse 9. Here's the hint. Here's the people. Here's going to be the ones praising the Lord. Revelation 7, 9 says, And after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one can number, of all nations and tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. Woo-hoo! Yeah. Not only are y'all going to be praising the Lord, but you're going to have palm branches. You're going to say, worthy is the Lamb, every one of you. <laughs> Even those of you that are not comfortable say, <laughs> every one of you. <laughs> every one of you. <laughs> worthy. <laughs> Never fails. I always have one that comes to me at the close of service. Hey. I'm not. That's just not me. You're probably not because you're not going to be there. <laughs> if you're born again, you're going to praise him. If you're born again, you're going to one day wave palm branches at him. That's what the scripture says. Now watch this. Who is this multitude of people going to be? Well, first of all, there will be a group of people, we call them the martyred saints. There will be a group of people who come out of great tribulation. There will be those who will be saved during the tribulation period. During tribulation, for the very first time, they heard the gospel, they heard the good news. And they were martyred, they were killed. The majority will be beheaded because of their faith because of their trust in Jesus Christ. Listen to me. There's, and it's okay to use this word. It's okay to use this terminology because there's no other way to really to describe it. But this great multitude who will be praising him and will be waving palm branches would basically be God's cheerleaders. Yeah, you heard me right. One day, every one of us that's gathered here tonight, we're going to be on the cheer squad. We're going to be cheering when we get to heaven. Amen. Amen. Now, perhaps, I don't know, maybe, Brother Jimmy will be leading the cheer. <laughs> Can't y'all see Brother Jimmy? I don't know. It might be Jared. No, I tell you what. <laughs> it's going to be Brother Ed. Ed. Oh, glory. <laughs> Hello? Might be Brother Clinton Lee. Are y'all ready for that event? Amen. It's going to take place. Well, perhaps we're all going to be there, and we're praising the Lord at the beginning of the marriage supper of the Lamb. But those martyred Christians, those that died during the Great Tribulation, they won't be there by themselves. There will be others there with them as well. Because those who will be participating in the celebration time will be each and every man and woman and young person that has ever trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Wow. Wow. I get to thinking of it like this. My father is already there.
I believe that my dad is looking forward to the day when we'll all be back together and we're going to all join together in praising the Lamb of God. Man, I've got grandparents already there. I, I, I have some siblings that's already there. What a day that's going to be. The people of God. And think about it. We've been raptured up. Tribulation is going on. And I have to believe that we're watching what's going on. And we've seen nearly seven years of horrible devastation. But now it's over. Now it's time to celebrate. That brings me to a third thing. Notice the place of this celebration. Verse 1. A lot of people stroke out over this. This loud celebration, this place of the praising, takes place, according to verse 1, where? A great multitude in, say it out loud, heaven. That's where the celebration is going to take place. It's going to take place in heaven. I don't know why so many people have got this idea that heaven is like this. <laughs> no, heaven is a noisy place. Did you know every time a person gets saved, the Bible says that 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of angels, they all are rejoicing. They are. So the celebration is going to take place in heaven. Now, why is it going to take place in heaven? Because that's where all the saved folk are going to be. Did Jesus not say, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and repair, prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus has gone to prepare that wonderful place for us. And it's going to be in that place one day where this great celebration is going to take place in heaven. I'm telling you, heaven one day is going to be rocking. It is. It really is. Not only do we see the period, the people, and the place, but notice what is the purpose of all this praise. Well, that purpose is wrapped up in that little phrase in verse 1 when John says, after these things. You see, to begin with, evil is, first of all, it, the evil has to run its course. The tribulation period is going to have to actually come to an end. Now Jesus is actually preparing for the return to this earth with you and I, with his saints, with his children. He's getting ready now to come back to the earth and set up his thousand-year millennial reign on the earth. And so now all that's about to take place. No wonder... No wonder that praise is, is about to echo up and down the streets of gold in heaven because the bride and the bride and the groom, we're about to come together once and for all. I've often said, you know, one of the most difficult things in life is to be with somebody that you love and then have to tell them bye. I, I don't like, I'm not good at byes. You know, we, 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 we had our youngest daughter here last week, and so last Sunday, Penny has to take her back to um, Slidell to get on the train to go back to North Alabama, and I tell you what, I just couldn't say bye. That's a hard thing to do, to look at your baby, and you don't know when I'm going to see her again, and I just don't like byes. Hello? especially when there's a grandchild involved. <laughs> I won't tell Brooks, bye. 
Oh, the day's coming when we're going to see the groom. And we'll never be separated ever again. All the days coming when, because of this great wedding, that we're going to see our loved ones again. And we will never, ever, ever have to say, Bye. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful, church? Come on. No wonder. No wonder. There's so much praise. The anticipation is building. Woo! We're about to have a family reunion. Wow! We are about to have the wedding of all the ages. And we're about to be in a party that a billion years from today is still going to be going on. <laughs> if that isn't enough, there's some particulars in the Scripture here. I don't know if you picked up on it as I was reading it a while ago, but there's some real particulars here about this praise. Let me show it to you. Now watch this. Now I have mine highlighted, but you can underline it, highlight it, circle it. But verse 1, you see the word, hallelujah. In verse 3, you see the word, hallelujah. Verse 4, you find the phrase, amen, hallelujah. And then in verse 6, you find the word once again, hallelujah. Church, let me say something. Please take this right. There's absolutely nothing wrong with getting excited about Jesus. There's absolutely nothing wrong about getting excited about spiritual things. I'm Watch this. There's nothing wrong with expressing and showing emotion in worship. In fact, our preacher, be careful now. We don't need to get carried away. I know some Baptists, the only time they get carried away is when the undertaker comes and gets them. <laughs> we ought to get excited in our worship. We ought to get excited about what God is doing. You know, the Bible says we're supposed to worship the Lord two ways. The Scripture says we are to worship Him in spirit and truth. Is that not what the Scripture says? Okay, we got it right, I think, as a church. We, we, we've, we've got the, the truth down. We do worship him in truth. But we still got a ways to go when it comes to worshiping him in spirit. We got a ways to go. Hello. We do. We got a ways to go because, see, watch this. We got a ways to go. See there? We got a ways to go because we still struggle saying amen. We still struggle. We still struggle. I mean, we're, we're starting because I see some of this. <laughs> we struggle. And you know what most people tell me? Well, I just wasn't raised like that. Amen. I wouldn't either. I, I, I mean, hey, I was raised in a good, wonderful, dead Southern Baptist church. You just didn't do those things. You didn't. You just didn't do those things. I hear this one. Well, that's just not my personality. Not mine either. You know, I'm, I'm, I know you don't think, but that's not my personality. I wasn't raised that way. But I'm telling you what. Something happened a few years ago 
God started revealing things, and God started showing me things, and now I can't help myself. I can't, I can't help myself. I mean, goodness alive. God forgive us for grieving his Holy Spirit. God forgive us because of all of our formalities and our stiffness and our, oh, God forgive us for the way we act sometimes in worship. Let me tell you something. And this, is, this goes for any church. I could pick out any church, any denomination, and hit the bullseye. We are more respectful to people than we are to a holy God. We are. We're more respectful for, to people than we are a holy God. Let me prove my point. We've been taught this, or at least I've been taught this, that the President of the United States is introduced and he walks into this very room out of respect to the man and the office that he holds. We stand up when the President walks in. Okay? Now, we did this two weeks ago. When those soldiers walked over there and picked that flag up and started, I stood up and put my hand across my heart. Because that means something to me. Hello? That means something to me. See that? See, see, you follow me? And I'll be the first to tell you, when the flag, when the flags and the colors come into a room, if you don't stand, that's disrespect. Shame on you. I'm going to take it a step further. I don't care where I'm at. When I go to LSU football game, when the band plays the national anthem, I don't act a fool like a bunch of them do. I paying tribute to my nation, to my country. Man, I get goosebumps when I hear the national anthem. Hello? Amen. So we do those things. And yet a holy God can move in a service and show up in a mighty way. God anoints a song. God can anoint a message. God can anoint a testimony. The Holy Spirit can be moving and people can be getting saved. And I forgot to tell y'all, I love you. <laughs> mm. Now, I've often said that what we do right now is preparation for over there. So we can shout and praise God and lift hands and wave palm branches and get excited. And, and I'm going to show you some more. Hey, this is just barely scratching the surface. Now, I'm going to show you all what y'all going to be doing here in about two weeks. Y'all going to be flabbergasted. Oh, I can't believe I'm going to do that. Well, you are. <laughs> now, notice what are these four hallelujahs all about? What really are the four hallelujahs all about? Go back to verse 1. It says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Here it is. Watch this. Salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God. All right. Here's the first one. Hallelujah. Say that out loud with me. Hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. Do you know what that word means? It means praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Now watch this. 
What is the difference between hallelujah, hallelujah, or hallelujah? What is the difference? Hallelujah is Hebrew. Hallelujah is Hebrew for hallelujah. Hallelujah is actually Greek. And hallelujah and hallelujah means the same thing. Hallelujah is what? No. Well, it is, but what language is it? Hebrew. And hallelujah is what? And what does hallelujah and hallelujah mean? Praise ye the Lord. Now, you, most of you I know know this, but for someone that might not, I want to show you something. The word hallelujah or hallelujah, I've heard it pronounced many ways. Hallelujah is a compound word. It's two words put together. The first is hallelujah. Ha hallelujah. And hallelujah means praise ye. Hallelujah, praise ye. The second compound of that word is yah. Hallelujah. Yah is or stands for Yahweh. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Yahweh. Praise be to Yahweh. Praise be to God. Watch this. All praise belongs to God. He is deserving of our praise. I remember many years ago, I was a sunbeam. Y'all remember what a sunbeam was? <laughs> I'm a sunbeam, a sunbeam. Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. Is that right? <laughs> that's back, that's way back before RAs and GAs. I was a sunbeam. We learned a little song when I was a sunbeam. And we even used to do it in big church on Sunday mornings. And it was this. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. That's right. And we'd stand up. And then they'd go and we'd refer, praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. And everybody stood. Praise ye the Lord. Brother Kirk, what if we broke out and did that Sunday morning? <laughs> hallelujah. 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 Now reverse it. Go. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Everybody. Praise ye the Lord. <laughs> See, some of y'all even have a hard time clapping for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hallelujah, hallelujah simply means praise the Lord. Now, something else. In verse 1, when John says, a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah. 
Guess what he uses there? It's actually in the present tense. And so it actually is translated like this, salvation, glory, and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Hallelujah. Salvation, glory, honor, and power to the Lord our God. Hallelujah. And it just keeps repeating over and over and over and over and over. And the one thing that I hear Baptists say, well, I don't like that course because it just repeats itself over and over. Well, you better get used to repeating things over and over because you're going to do it when you get to heaven. <laughs> It's just continuous. It's over a great multitude. I mean, we're talking about millions of people, everybody. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God. Oh, salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We're going to have such a glorious time. So what's all the shouting about? Why is all this celebration? Why is everybody shouting? Why is everybody, hold on. You know why everybody's ecstatic? You know why everybody is shouting? Because of our salvation. Man, salvation. That's why everybody is excited. Because we've been born again. Because our names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. Listen to me. If you can't praise the Lord because of your salvation, if you can't praise the Lord because your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life, you better go back and check out your salvation experience. People that's been saved are people who love to praise the Lord. Amen. I, I, I get so nervous sometimes when I teach like this because there's, oh, well, I disagree with you. I, it's not me. This is what the scriptures teach. I can tell you one thing that's true of every one of us in this room. Everybody in this room, there's something in your life that you get excited over. Some of you, it's hunting. Some of you, it's fishing. I get excited when I go. Ask Brother Jimmy. Me and Brother Jimmy, Brother Lewis, we went fishing a few months ago. We out there and just us three. And all of a sudden, my cork starts dancing across. Woo! <laughs> I got, woo! Glory! And Brother Lewis said, Son, catch him. Don't fall in. Just catch him. I mean, I'm getting excited. And it was an alligator. <laughs> I got it. Listen, that thrilled my heart when that alligator swallowed my cork. I was trying to get him in the boat. And I'm thinking, I, had, I was rocking. That. What my Brother Jimmy? Brother, Brother Jimmy was there. He can't hear a word I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I get excited when I go to LSU. There's something about standing there on, what is that, Victory Hill? And I hear the golden band from Tigerland, them drums beat. I get mad. I get antsy. I can't sit. I can't. Boy, when them boys run out of that tunnel, I'm hoarse before the game ever starts. When my grandbabies show up, I get excited about that. Hello. Well, they'd call me today, called up the office. Abby says, Brother Dennis, 
grandfather said, he's got your hamburger. And he got you some homemade ice cream. <laughs> I promise you, I didn't leave him off and say, okay, well, I guess I'll have to go back there and eat. <laughs> My bum legs and feet, I skipped and hopped across the parking lot to get back. <laughs> I got excited. And then Brother Jim had to confess my sin, said one bowl was enough. I said, you worry about your own sin. Don't you worry about my sin. <laughs> you bring that ice cream back out of here. I got excited. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Look, look up here at me. What do you get excited about? What do you get excited about? What causes your heart to skip beats and what causes your palms to get sweaty because you're just so excited? See, everybody's thinking about something right now. You, yeah, I'm huh, being, I see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm just trying to get lead up to this. Why can't we get excited like that with Jesus? After all, listen. He came to you. You didn't go looking for him. He came to you when your life was a wreck, when your life was in shambles, when you were in the miry clay. He came to you, and he reached down there and picked you up out of the miry clay. He bathed you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet and wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm telling you, every day that you live, you are blessed, blessed. I'm looking at blessed people. Why can't we get excited about him? Mm. You see what I'm saying? The first hallelujah is because we're saved. But there's a second hallelujah. Uh oh, it's getting deeper. There's another hallelujah. So there's the hallelujah for salvation, but then secondly, there's the hallelujah for settling up. There's going to be an hallelujah one day for the settling up. God is going to settle once and for all every account. God one day will judge every sin. One day evil will be judged once and for all. One of these days, sin, my friend, sin is finally going to be repaid. You can rock it down. Listen to me. Listen. No one will ever get away with sin. There is a payday someday. It's coming. It's coming. Your sin, one of two things. Your sin will either be forgiven by God or it will be judged in the pits of hell. It's that simple. Our sin will be forgiven by God or be judged by God when we spend eternity in hell. You'll either be pardoned by Christ or you're going to be punished in hell. Friend, listen to me. There's no such place as purgatory. It's either heaven or it's hell. There's no in between. Amen? Well, when the sin account one day is finally settled... I'm telling you what, you and I, we're going to be shouting. One day when, the, when that sin account is finally settled, there's going to be shouts of praise being heard all throughout the hallways and the highways of glory. Hallelujah! For true and righteous are his judgments. 
Wow. The day's going to come when we're going to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you died on the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Lord, that you shed your precious blood. Thank you, Lord, that you took care of my enemies. Wow. I mean, all of us, thousands, millions of us at one time. Woo! Thank you, God. That's what the shouting is going to be about. There's the hallelujah for our salvation. There's the hallelujah for settling of the account. But number four, no, number three, I've done lost count. There's the hallelujah for God's sovereignty. There will be the hallelujah in that day for God's sovereignty. Look at verse four. And so the 24 elders and the four living creatures, they fell down and they worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, amen. That means what? So be it. Amen. Hallelujah. Whew. Let me tell you something tonight. In the midst of all your troubles right now, and I hope we shared that as clearly and plainly as we possibly could this past Sunday. In the midst of all your troubles tonight, God is still on the throne. In the midst of all that is happening, all that is going on, watch this. God is still on the throne, and nobody's going to knock him off. There's not enough demons in hell tonight to knock God off the throne. He's still in control. He's still the one that's in charge. He's ruling He's reigning. He's king of kings. He is Lord of lords. There's no God like our God. I'm telling you tonight, look to him. Lean on him, and I guarantee you, he will see you through it. So there's the hallelujah for salvation. There's the hallelujah for settling up. There's the hallelujah for God's sovereignty. But five, verse 5 and 6, we find an hallelujah for his supremacy. His supremacy. He is supreme. There's no God like praise our God. Oh, you look at verse 5 and 6. Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thunderings and saying, they were saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. What does the word omnipotent mean? It means all powerful. All powerful. And because he is the Lord God omnipotent, guess what? Our God reigns. Psalms 97 and verse 1 says, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, church. He deserves our praise. And I believe this with all my heart. Yes, he deserves all my praise. But he shouldn't have to wait till I get over there for me to praise him. I believe we ought to start praising him in the here and the now. And praise our way all the way to glory. I want to praise him while going up. I really do. And I believe we all will. <laughs> I've always had young people. Preacher, I get kind of nervous when you preach like that because, you know, Pastor, I, I, I still want to live my life and, 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 and I want to be able to have some of the things in life like you. I just, you know, I, I want to go to heaven. I, I just hope the Lord doesn't come back for 50 years. I understand why young people say things like this, but can I assure you of something tonight? I don't care how old you are or how young you may be. If the trumpet were to sound tonight and we go, 
we're not going to say, oh, Lord, no. No, Lord, I was hoping this is still 50 years in the, oh, Lord, no, I promise you. That's not what, that's not going, I don't care, watch this. I have to believe in my little two-year-old grandson. If God was to call us home tonight, my grandson's going to be, oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. You ever thought about that? <laughs> the funniest thing happened to me yesterday. Yeah, it wasn't too funny. I had to have a stress test. And because of my feet and my legs giving me, I had a nuclear stress test. So they put me up on this couch I was sitting up. And they hooked me all up and they was telling me everything's fixing to happen to me, and they put this IV in me, and she said, now I'm fixing to put some nuclear. Boy, they brought this heavy thing, and I couldn't believe it. They, it was nuclear. I'm thinking, well, I'm fixing to die. They're fixing to put in my veins what runs the power plant up there in St. Francisville. <laughs> anyway, she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to inject this into your IV, and she said, you're going to feel hot. You're going to have a hot flash. You're going to feel what us women feel all the time. <laughs> She's going to have a hot flash. That's what she said. I didn't know what a hot flash was. I do now. <laughs> and she said, your heart's just going to immediately start racing. And you're going to feel lightheaded. And you're going to be nauseous. And you're going to feel like you're about to die, but you'll be okay. <laughs> And so she said, now before I give you, she says, I like to play music now. Do you care? She said, I, 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 I said, no, that's okay. So she got over on her computer and she typed something in and I looked on her screen and the name David Phelps came up. And it, the music started and she started putting that medicine and he started singing, we shall behold him. And I'm thinking, oh, am I fixing to go? Man, why is she playing that kind of music, putting that poison in my... I was saying, Lord, I, you know, I want to go, but I didn't want to go today, you know. <laughs> I, I want to hang around a few more months or years or two. You know. Oh, listen to me. But I was ready because I found myself. I was sitting up there, and I was singing, We shall behold him. Yes, we shall be. And she said, put your hands down. Put your hands down. You're messing up the EKG. I forgot. I was, I was wanting to. <laughs> I was wanting to. I mean, I can't help it. Man, you start saying, man, we shall behold him. I was about to just break out right there and have a spell right in the midst of a stress test. Are y'all ready to see him tonight? Amen. Now, I know I'm not trying to get up a train load to go to tonight. I'm just. <laughs> Are y'all ready for that day? Now, wow. Can I tell you something? He delights in our praise. He even demands our praise. Now, let me close. Look at the preparation. With the celebration over, now the celebration is about to begin. The bride and the groom is fixed to be united forever. Now, let's look at a couple things that we're told about the wedding. I want you to see the attention of the wedding. The attention of the wedding. Now, when weddings take place, who is it? Now, question. Now, watch this. Go with me for just a moment. Every time there's a wedding in the sanctuary... Who is it that gets all of the attention? I'm, listen, I've been preaching weddings for 30 years, and I have never, and I've never understood this, I've never seen the people stand up when the groom walked in. 
I've walked out with every one of them. We'd have walked out and everybody's still sitting. But you let that back door open up and that bride steps out, and guess what? Everybody in the church stands, and they, and they all turn around and look back there. And everybody, ooh, oh, isn't she gorgeous? And that's usually what I'm saying. That's the same girl that came to my office six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. I can't tell you how many times I'm thinking, hey, what did what, you do, treat in the other one that you yeah. <laughs> and, and usually the groom is standing up here. I can't tell you how many times the grooms have leaned and said, oh, do the short version. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I'm excited. But now, watch this. Why do we stand up when the bride walks in? Could it be we stand in honor of the bride because we, we understand how much the family had to pay for the wedding? <laughs> no. No. I, I, no. You know why we stand up? Because she's the star of the show. Come on. That's, that's a fact. We stand up because she's the star of the... Watch this. Every wedding, the attention is on the bride. They could care less who stand up here by me. It's always the one that walks down the aisle. I want you to notice something. Piano's organs... That's the cue. That's the cue for the bride. Here comes the bride. Dum, dum, da dum. But in that day, it's not going to be here comes the bride. It's going to be here comes the groom. It's all going to be reversed in that day. In that day, the attention's not going to be on the bride, but rather it's going to be on the bridegroom. Why not? He's the lamb. Why not? He's the only one that could take away the sins of the world. Why not? Because he's the great I am. I'm he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the bright and morning star. He's the Lord of heaven and earth and Lord of the universe. Why not? He's the one that died for me. He's the son of the living God, my, 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 what a bridegroom. Amen, church. No wonder the attention in that day will actually be upon him. But then we're told about the apparel. I'm almost done. Verse 8 says, and it was granted unto, and it was granted to her to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What's the bride supposed to wear at the wedding? She's supposed to wear a beautiful garment, a beautiful dress that's white. John tells us that we're going to all be wearing, listen to this, here's what John says about us, we'll be wearing garments of our own making. But did you notice that he described them like this, they will be clean and bright. Our garments in that day will be clean and bright. That ought not surprise us. You remember what Ephesians 5 verse 27 says that he might present to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish. When I look at the church today mm, I don't see holy and I don't see white. I don't see without 
blemish. We're not very clean right now. We're not, church, let's be honest. We're not very clean right now. Oh, but one day we will be. One day the bride is going to be clean. Oh, listen to me. There's fixing to be a preparation. There's about to be a great preparation. Watch this. Listen to the detail. You and I are about to be caught up, cleaned up, and cheered up. You're about to be caught up, cleaned up, cheered up. In other words, your sin's going to be no more. He's going to clean us after he calls us up, and then you're going to be cheered up. You're going to have a smile on your face whether you want it or not. You're going to have a pep in your step whether you want to or not. Well, preacher, hold on. Now, I thought that when I gave my heart to Jesus, I automatically became the bride of Christ. Listen, don't miss this. I thought I was already the bride of Christ. The answer is, well, yes and no. Yes and no. When you invited Jesus into your heart, please don't miss this. I know we're running a little late. Listen, when you gave your heart to Jesus, that was our engagement. When we give our heart to Jesus, that is when we become engaged. Now listen to this. When you are engaged, the day you receive your engagement ring, the wedding didn't take place that day. Amen? Come on. You were engaged, but the wedding did not take place at that moment. Watch this. The wedding is not going to actually take place until after the rapture. The wedding will not take place until after the rapture. Think of it like this. When the bride walks down the aisle in a wedding ceremony, we play Here Comes the Bride. But she's not married yet. When she walks down the aisle, even though we're playing Here Comes the Bride, she's still only engaged. When she steps up here on this platform, she's still not the bride yet. She's still only engaged. In the same way, when you and I were redeemed, we simply became engaged. We are engaged tonight, but in that day, after the rapture takes place, there's going to be a great wedding celebration. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. That day is still yet to come. Wow. I can't wait for the great marriage celebration. Well, notice the apparel or the attendance. Verse 9 says, who are called? Who will be the attendants? Who's going to be the guest at this great wedding? Who's the bridegroom going to be? Say it out loud. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Well, you can't have a wedding without a bride, so who's the bride? Who will the guests be? It'll be everyone who's been born again. All the New Testament saints will be there. All of the Old Testament saints are going to be there. The Bible indicates that our Lord's friend John the Baptist is even going to be a guest. Why does it say that? Because John the Baptist died before the church came into existence. But Jesus said he called him the friend of the bridegroom. Oh, there's going to be a lot of people there in that day. I, look, I like to think of it like this. There's John the Baptist, but there's all the Old Testament saints. 
There's going to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but guess what? Standing there, there's going to be Noah and Moses and Elijah. Wow, there's going to be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's old Adam and Eve. And the list just goes on. Can you imagine having to pay for a reception like that? Millions upon millions. Such a great multitude that you can't even begin to name it. But here's the most important question of all. Will you be there? Will you be at the great marriage supper of the Lamb? I've had this in my office, and I want to show you the picture of what it could possibly look like, the invitation. And sitting at the head of the table is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And throughout eternity, there's your seat. There's your seat. There's my seat. Will you be sitting at the great banquet table? You know, I've always, when I first saw that picture, I said, boy, I want that place sitting right there to the right. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, forgive me. I'm sounding like Peter and John and talking about who's the greatest and who's going to no. know. You know what? I believe that no matter where you sit at that great dinner table, you may be sitting a million miles away, but when you look, you're going to behold him. And I just got a feeling it's going to be like it's just you and Jesus sitting there Amen. all together. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Just to look upon his face. Wow. What a day that will be. And everybody said, Amen. let's just stop there.